This is the Sausage Hour, episode number 68. I am your host, Baruti Carl Alexander, the Source Seeker. That's what I call myself. And I welcome everybody to this powerful program, Building Black Wealth. What is black wealth? I would say it's a, a, a black man or a black family or a black circle that has developed a economic standing. It is a black man, a black family, a black circle that is able to generate jobs within the black community, is able to generate good standing and good culture in the black community. That is gonna be our first question when we go to our guest, who I'm gonna ask him to introduce themselves on this great pro. We have some very, very powerful guests, some who have been here before and some, uh, but never everybody has been here together. So this is a unique and powerful program where, where we're gonna get some great insight. And I'm gonna start with brother Jeffrey Hill. Please introduce yourself, brother. All right, my name is Jeffrey Hill. I am the CEO of Hill Financial Group, a wealth accumulation firm. I am a top 100 award-winning firm in the financial services industry, and I am happy to be here. I, I appreciate you, brother. And my brother helped me to uh, learn the Zoom, and I will always be indebted to him. Appreciate it, brother. Uh, next, I will want to go with uh, brother Farrard. Uh, let me say that right. Far Supreme X. Introduce yes, yourself, sir. brother. Yes, sir. How's everybody doing? I'm brother, I'm brother Far Mac D, Supreme X, uh, CEO of Far Money Network. And I'm down here in the Central Florida area, but I'm originally from uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Peace and power, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us again. Sister Cassandra. Hi, my name is Cassandra Barnes. I'm actually not a true finance person, although my family uh, were business owners or are business owners, and I come from a background where we're very financially conscious. I'm a registered nurse uh, for 34 years. I have a master's in psychotherapy, and I am launching my own mental health management center, so I'm very excited about that and needing to make sure financially everything is on point. So I'm happy to be a part of this. Can point. I ask the name of the, is it the Victoria Barnes Mental Health Center? Yeah. And where did the name come from? My grandmother uh, who raised me and was a tremendous inspiration. So I'm naming my center in memorial of her legacy yes, and her memory. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Blessings. Always glad to have my powerful sister with us. Yes. Uh, brother Willie Perry, as, as well as Brother Anamaki, I'll please introduce yourself, but then go into the first question, which is, what is Black Health? Excuse me, I'm thinking of another show. <laughs> what is building Black Wealth? But it is Black Health also, sir. That's why I'm thinking of it also. It is Black Health. Building black wealth is akin to black wealth. Take it away, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Broody and Bukise, uh, AKA Mr. Carl Alexander. Uh, Mrs. Barnes, I'd like to go on record this afternoon and say I do practice chivalry. So therefore you should have been the first one to be introduced. Ladies are always first. Uh, as a gesture of professional courtesy, I'd like to ask whenever we're speaking, the people who are not speaking be on mute until such time that they can uh, keep the distortions down and also the feedback at the same time too. Mr. Uh, Rudy and Bakisha. But I, but I, I want, want to say that if, if you have a comment on the other person's uh, comment, you, you can uh, raise your hand or interject also. So we do, uh, because especially if it's an important point, that you feel you need to make. So I just want to interject that. I'm, I'm sorry, brother, you continue. And so again, I, I hold my position on professional courtesy because that's very important because uh, each point's being made. If you do have a rebuttal or retort or either a, uh, a closing remark, et cetera, okay, I think you should be allowed to do that without any interruptions at all. I think one of the things we have to use as black people is learn to respect each other. So professional courtesy to me goes a long way. Uh, 
I, I addressed the question of uh, building black wealth based on three concepts. One is overcoming the effects of our history. Two, confronting the conditions of slavery. And three, our relationship between money and wealth. That's how I really address it. We have a unused relationship with money and wealth that were developed many years ago. And also we have a condition which we went through for more than 400 plus years we have to overcome. We are not completely healed of that at this point in time. It's still a systemic sickness. So to that end, I would say that's how I would address it at this point. I don't want to go into too much detail at this time because it gets to look a little bit more too, too philosophical. Okay. Uh, yes, we and we always practice respect right here on the Source Seeker Hour. And uh, we uh, continue to uh, show respect, give respect. And speaking of respect, money helps in a way for you to have respect. I mean, if you don't have money, even though we understand about philanthropy, and I do want to mention Prairie View a and University received $50 million from uh, uh, the, the ex-wife of Jeff Bezos. So that was a great thing that uh, took place there. Um, the first question, what are some of the unique difficulties of black people who are not entertainers or athletes building wealth and how can we work together to overcome some of these difficulties? I wanna ask that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna follow my brother's, um, what he said. Sister Cassandra, we're gonna start the first question with you. Okay, um, repeat the question again. I the question is, what are some of the difficulties that we as black people have building Black wealth, building wealth. Well, one of the main difficulties is as the gentleman stated, because as a culture, our relationship with money is lacking. Um, generally, when you're my age, which is 58 years old, I am unique in that my parents were multimillionaires, but that's rarely gonna be the case in our community. So nine times out of 10, we don't even as a culture have a healthy relationship with money. We don't understand financial products. We don't understand um, we're more consumer consumers than savers or investors. Uh, the whole dynamic that surrounds money because most of our culture is not familiar with the concepts of actual wealth building, okay? So you have to almost go back to your financial blueprint and uproot a lot of that. And you would have to uh, re-educate yourself, so to speak, to even understand uh, the basic dynamics of wealth, even as we discussed in previous shows, dealing with something as simple as life insurance. I mean, you have a ma uh, major entertainers that are worth multi-millions of dollars that don't even have wheels in place. Even more recently, Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman did not have a wheel. Prince did not have a wheel. So it's like you try to process like, how is this even possible when you have financial educators and advisors around you and you don't even have the basic the basic vehicles in place so it comes back to what he stated the whole we have to be educated as a culture we have to understand the be, these vehicles of security and safety and put those in place first and then your wealth building is on top of that foundation, but your basic foundation has to be in place first. And that's what we haven't really been educated on. And, and people think it's a lot harder than what it is. Like I buy my own stock. I'm not a stock advisor. I'm not a broker. And I'm really not that smart as it relates to stock. I just opened up um, my account with TD Ameritrade and just started buying one stock at a time. Every payday, I would buy at least one stock in, in a particular company. Now I own stock in at least 10 different companies. 
and nobody tells me what to do. I just kind of look at it and go with my gut feeling and just start purchasing shares. I don't really know what I'm doing from an educated perspective, but I'm doing something that, because I lost my almost my entire portfolio back in March. But right today, I have probably quadrupled the amount of stock that I own when it crashed in March because I was intentional about rebuilding it and um, being intentional about putting something in place. And yes, it goes up and down and sometimes you lose it, sometimes you gain it, but at least you have something in place that can help you build on. Most people, even though I put it on my page, I tell, you know, what stocks I bought. I tell them, if you want me to show you how to set up the account, and less than 10 people have messaged me for me to show them how to set up an account. You know, it's just as easy as purchasing a shirt from a store. It's extremely easy. And they won't even seek out information. And, and why, you know? do you think, why, why do you think that is, Sister Cassandra? Because I think they think that it's so difficult, that it's very, very hard, or that you have to have a lot of money. I started buying, I'll say, for example, Blackberry stock was $8, and, I mean, $4.80 something cents per share. So I said, okay, I could either go buy food at Papa Do's or I can buy me five shares of stock. And so I forwent the Papa Do's meal and I transferred $25 from my checking account and bought five shares of stock. They don't realize that it is extremely simple. If you start trying to read books and listening to a lot of information, it can be extremely overwhelming, but you don't have to know as much as you think you have to know to get started. And I think that is one of the main barriers is they think they don't know enough or that they have to have a lot of money. I, I want to go back to when I made that Freudian slip and said black health, we have had some things done to us. First of all, it was illegal to learn to read. It was illegal. And it's always been a, a psychology of, of against being smart, against against being learned. But let me also say that uh, we've had incidents like the, the Tulsa uh, riots that black folks built up so much and then it was just taken away like that. That's discouraging. And so I've heard people say, uh, uh, no matter what we build, they're just gonna tear it down. They're just gonna take it away. Uh, uh, Brother Supreme, what do you say about that particular issue? What are the difficulties of building black wealth. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, one of the difficulty, the main difficulties is, is like what you said, it, it deals with the fear factor of the black person. Uh, and, it, and, this, and this comes from a long generation of, we growing up under workers. You know, my grandfather was a worker, I'm pretty sure his grandfather was a worker. My father's still working, almost 70 right now. You know what I'm saying? Don't hasn't did no investments. Uh, my grandfather's on both sides left, didn't have anything. So it's a it's a perpetuating mindset that gets pumped down from generation to generation until one like one of us just stand up and say, "Well, I'm gonna break this trend." If you don't have that to just sit up our families and start teaching them about the signs of business, you know, the signs of money and the signs of how all this banking system and all this stuff work. But in the public school system, in college, that type of education is kept out away from the masses because the whole school system, that whole model is designed to make us fit into corporate America to either be workers or be the cleaners or they buildings or they establishments, you know, that's what that's for. So the main difficulty is us trying to talk to the generations or talk to whoever and bust back that mindset and beat that back. So it's about education at the start of it. So we're not financially educated. We don't have any financial literacy and we have been trained to overlook opportunities that might be right in our face. 
you know, so as we, you know, our people instead of them looking for an opportunity to make more money, they are really looking for a job. They might already have a job, but they want another job. You know, they might already know. I talk to people that got three jobs. Like, How you got three jobs? How's that even possible? You know what I'm saying? I got two full-time jobs. How's that possible? You don't have no time to think, read, nothing. You know, so if you act, talk to the average young person uh, that's out of our community, they don't want to read nothing, you know, and I, and I hit them all the time. They don't, I say, do you know Warren Buffett is? Do you know who these people is? I like Warren Buffett read five newspapers per day. You know what I'm saying? They be like, nah, I don't know. Well, he worth about a hundred billion. So it might be something connected to you reading that could help elevate you. But like I said, if you don't have the time to do it and you don't have the desire to do it, then we have just become conditioned to just work, pay bills, work, pay bills, work, pay bills. We send our children to school. Somebody else is educating them. We only with them for a short period of time throughout a day. And if you're dealing in a, in a, it's rare where you got a full household, but if it's a, if it's a husband and a wife in the household, father and a mother, both of them probably got jobs. So they probably spend less and less time with the children. They off in daycare, or they off in school. You know what I'm saying? So the, the, the principles of family and the principles of what real wealth is or how to build wealth. And it's really about, Leverage. It really just come down to the word leverage, right? About how to understand leverage and what leverage is. These conversations is not going on in the household. You know, like I said, the father's at work, the mother might be at work. You know what I'm saying? If one of them don't have a job, then it's tension inside the house because there's not enough money coming in from one from one parent. We living in a world now where the dollar has diminished so significantly spending power. Well, one income is not going to take care of the family on a, on, a, on a good level or a decent level anymore. It might used to be like that in the 60s and the 50s, but this 2020. And one, one income coming from a person that's probably making $20 an hour, if that, that don't understand the tax gain, don't understand compound interest, don't afraid to step out there because we run out and get in debt, whether we get in mortgage, whether we get mortgages, or whether we go and get car loans that we don't own you know, and that we don't really have, then we just using our credit to get stuff to make us look good. But at the same time, that keeps the person in that hamster wheel because I can't do nothing because why? I got a mortgage to pay. I got a car note to pay. So I don't want to risk these $1,000. And what if I lose? Like she's saying about, Ms. Burns said about stock. The average person like, what if I lose? Not, not, not looking at what if it goes up? We don't look at it like that. And that's one of the quotes from Jeff Bezos uh, that was just released on our, uh, in our organization that he said he always look at risk on return. You know, risk on return. What's the risk on the return? So if I'm putting up $1,000 that could probably make, make 10000 or even more, then the risk is I'm just, I might lose 1000 But if I lose, I lose. At least I tried and I should learn something from that mistake if it don't go right, I should learn how to see investment. Like Warren Buffett, he can see good investments. He don't really make bad investments, but at one point in time, he might have did make bad investments, but he learned from that. He took it as a learning experience, a learn, or educational process that we go through. And that's one of the difficulties, or the main difficulty that I feel that we have to get over is the education or the mindset that the majority of our, our people have an employee mindset. And that's where the base of us stuck at. And that's the difficult factor that we got to get around to really reach them with, hey, look, we doing this over here. You can do it too. Yes, brother. It goes back to that black health that I was talking about because we've been conditioned so many ways to work against ourselves. And if we can find a way to help a better mind through education and through health, we can find a way to bring black wealth. Uh, Brother Jeff, what do you say about the difficulties of building black wealth? Man, it's a combination of what everybody has said. You know, I, I've been in the financial services industry now for about 11 and a half years and I've seen you know, it's different when you are an individual setting your own plans versus coming from my background, having the opportunity to see so 
many variations of families, incomes, backgrounds, educational. So my perspective is unique because I get to see it probably more than the average person because I'm dealing with people in their money. So I'm having to walk them through the conversations. I'm having to build the new paradigms. I'm having to teach them so much. And I don't remember who said this phrase, but it's not what you know that hurts you. It's what you know that just ain't so. And there's so much noise out there when it comes to financial issues and where to start learning and who to follow. And there's so many opposing different thoughts. It's hard sometimes for people to know what's really real out there. What is really based on math, science, economics. And one of the things that, uh, what challenged me to write a book was what I just explained. The cognitive dissonance that we have with so much information and misinformation out there. And so many people are trying to sell a product, right? And I get it. And the problem is there, what's being sold and what's being taught is rooted in some history. And there's a lot of things when it comes to investing that is absolutely true. And all these truisms are what make it hard to shift out, well, what's good for me? What's actually gonna work for my family? How do I start with the essential building blocks? And and, 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 and I remember hearing people early in my career saying, hey, Jeff, I don't want to be insurance poor, right? And I also don't want to be insurance rich, meaning I don't want to leave all this extra money behind for people to blow it. And, and that's what I mean by unwinding some of the paradigms. So you mean to tell me you would rather build up all this money and leave it to the government? You want the government as part of your beneficiary list? You want to leave this money to the Internal Revenue Service as opposed to your family? And most people, when you have to phrase it differently, they don't think about that. That's what I mean by cognitive dissonance. We hear this and we change, we shift with the winds. And a lot of it is just really not understanding what half the language means, what some of these contracts mean. We know we talk about the, the celebrities. Celebrities don't necessarily have it better than us. You would think so, but why is it that ESPN can do a series called 30 for 30 going broke? When you can get all these multi-million dollar contracts and in five to seven years, you are flat broke. Why is it that you can see Unsolved Mysteries talking about the curse of the lottery when five to seven years, you're broke? Well, here's the thing, well, I want you guys to understand. When you retire, same thing, typically five to seven years, you are broke. So out of all of this knowledge we have out there, we sometimes don't take the initiative to say, well, Ms. Barnes says, I got to start somewhere. I may not understand it all, but it let me be in the game. So when I maybe I understand, well, why did I lose? What was going on in the market? Let me pay attention to some of this stuff and just figure it out, right? And then sometimes when you call on a professional, you don't necessarily know what's what. Now, one of the things that I've experienced is this industry, the financial services industry is, it's a really old industry. And it has typically been dominated by white people. Nothing against that. It is what it is. Well, I fortunately started my career with New York Life. New York Life is the oldest and largest mutual life insurance company in the United States and one of the largest in the world. I left them and went independent because I wanted to build my own brand, but I'm glad that I started with that company because I learned a lot about the history of African-Americans and finance. New York Life was the first major life insurance company that actually hired a black guy. And this guy was the, uh, the treasurer for Dr. Martin Luther King. His, his name was Cirillo Maxween. Cyrilla McSween was a, a, a man, there's a name in insurance called Ben Feldman. And Ben Feldman is, tout, is touted as the number one agent in the world. I think he's in like in the Guinness Book of World Workers as down as the number one insurance agent in the world. But what you don't hear about is Cyrilla McSween who beat Ben Feldman on several occasions by out, he outproduced him. You don't hear about him because he was a black guy. He was in the business when you couldn't even come through the front door. They had to meet him out back. Here's your rate book. You go sell some policies. You can't come in the front door. And he went on to start the, the Black McDonald's Foundation. And basically, it's, it's a core group of Black people who want to franchise McDonald's businesses. So this was in our generation, OK? Think about some of the people who were freedom fighters back then. These people are still alive today. So what I'm saying is we are. 70 plus years behind the curve in terms of just having a black person that was in our industry advocating for us. Now, when you go back 70 years, and it's been it's been a little less than that, 
Think about how much stuff we didn't have, how many freedoms we didn't have. We couldn't get in school, all this kind of stuff. So we couldn't get the knowledge. And then when you think about most of us read on a fourth grade level, and that's just not African-Americans, that's just people in general. Our IQ isn't high enough sometimes to understand some of the basic language in the contracts. So again, a confused mind does not take action. If we don't know what something means, we are least likely to do it. And that's why so many people won't go click on your post to say, let me figure out how to do this. But then there's also the element of, well, now that I know, I can't use that excuse of being ignorant. Because it's easy to say, well, I didn't know. I, you know, I can't be held accountable if someone I didn't know. And you think that gets you by, but you're only setting yourself up to fail when you don't educate yourself. So you got to start with a, a, a deep-rooted foundation and understanding financial IQ. I talk a lot about Robert Kiyosaki because that's where my financial IQ shifted a lot. But then I got out there and I made some mistakes. That means I tried to do something. I actually tried to put some of this stuff into place. I tried to see what it looks like. Now I have an LLC. I have an S Corp. And I'm looking at opening more businesses because I started to understand the layers of the tax game. And again, as much as I know, there's still so much I don't know. But that's where you want to bring a team of people around you. And that's what we don't have. We don't sometimes have that person we can call and say, hey, can you explain this to me real quick in layman's terms? But we need to take that conversation and then go educate ourselves even more. It's not fun to sit there and watch a documentary on finance. It's boring. I'm in the industry and I'll fall asleep sometimes and I'll have to wake up, rewind it and watch it again. It's not easy to pick up a book talking about mapping out. I'm holding up a book. You can't see it. But mapping out the millionaire mystery. It's easy. It's easy. Easy to do, but also easy to not do because it's not fun. We don't get that instant gratification as that, as that pop of those. And I remember early, uh, there was a lady who was trying to recruit me into network marketing. She was a friend of mine. And, and, and I'll kind of wrap up with this so we can move to the next question. But this lady came over, me being a financial advisor, my financial IQ was higher than hers. It still is, but she's learned more now. And I remember telling her about the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. And she looked the book up and she said, Jeff, that's $7, $7 for a book. I don't have $7 to pay for a book. And I was like, but you bought a $13 bottle of wine over here. <laughs> yes. I hear you, man. I hear you. Brother Will Perry, uh, talk about the difficulties, but also what are the new opportunities that we have in this virtual world? Well, you guys have covered so much information this afternoon, make me want to go back and do some more studying. The key thing basically is that, again, dealing with educating the pup, uh, the masses in general, and we got to get the educational level, which is seventh grade education, by the way, uh, general public in, in the US when it comes to finance at this point, to get them on board. It's a difficult job because we're dealing with, with a culture biases at the same time too. So the key thing is that we just have to, have to keep throwing up mud against the wall, some of them down the stick. You aren't gonna get everybody, you're not gonna save everyone. As the term always goes, can you make the whole world a temple? The answer is no, because everybody cannot be saved. A couple of things, Ms. Barnes, to help you out there. The key thing about this best is called positioning. I wanna write this down. Positioning basically means that you're in the right place at the right time. You can't play the market, you can't chase the market, you can't outguess it, you gotta be positioned. Position being having a good diversified portfolio at the same time, knowing what your risk ratio actually is. That can very easily be computed out up front. When you find your customers' risk ratios, you know where to place them both aggressive and also uh, conservative at the same time too. Uh, I've been dealing with the stock market since I've been in undergrad school. And by the way, uh, kudos to my brother from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Park High School, Thunder and Herd. <laughs> Goes back, back in the day. The key thing is that I bought my first share of stock when I was a junior in undergrad school by now uh, state representative Earl Hilliard, who taught the business game to his, his class. He issued a challenge to those students that can you guys go out and do something with the money that you have. Most of us didn't have the money, we, we were undergrad kids in school. So he asked us to <clears throat> put aside what they call the, uh, the loose chain syndrome. Loose change since wrong basically means you leave it in the morning, leave it home in the morning time with dollar bills in your, in, in your pocket. At the end of the day, you come out with change in your pocket at the same time which stuff you actually actually bought. Take that change, put it into a jar somewhere. And over a month period of time, that that, that pocket full of change becomes five bucks, ten bucks, fifteen bucks, etc. On on up. 
and that money can be used to to get a broker's firm account set up and operating. And also kudos, Mrs. Barnes of TD Ameritrade. That is my uh, uh, discount broker of, of, of choice dealing with my my clients at the same time too. They don't charge you every time you spits these or either move around the corner. At the time. I have a little challenge that one of my grandkids is right beside me. <laughs> We're trying to teach them at the same time. The key thing basically is about to start running, then I'll move on, is that positioning. Always learn to position yourself, always diversify your portfolio. You don't put all your eggs in one basket, okay? That's important. Other side of that coin as well is learn to understand the bond market. That's very important as well, okay? There are different types of bonds that are actually out there that you can buy. And some simple ones can buy at the same time too. My mom was an avid saver. My dad was a construction worker in concrete. I learned my financial foundation from my mother <clears throat> back in the day that I have the bank accounts that we have now. They went to the post office every time they get paid and bought money orders. They didn't have a bank account because they know how to save the money that well. So I learned that, that thing from her. My dad was a part-time entrepreneur at the same time too. There's a thing known as a camp meeting that most black folks went to back in the day where they all sit around, they entertain each other, they got caught up on, on music at the same time too. Most of the guys over there were actually entrepreneurs. They sold, my dad showed fish sandwiches and sold ice cream, okay? And there were other things that were doing at the same time. So the information has been there, except we have a problem now teaching young people how to understand how this whole market really changed. Uh, Reginald Lewis, am I familiar with that, with, with that guy? If not, read Reginald Lewis's book. And, it, and I won't tell you the title, just remember the name, look him up when, I, when, when the program is actually over. I'll say, lot, the, I'll say the name if you allow, brother. That's fine, go ahead. <laughs> uh, why should white, white guys have all the fun? Absolutely, absolutely. The key thing is that he set the foundation as my mentor, okay, what he, he did. So I've used that same paradigm for the last 20 some plus years out there teaching in, in, the, in the streets and also helping my community move forward. We've been able to amass anywhere between 25 to $26 million with the refunds in the last 34 years in which we ran a tax program that's trans right Madonna. So we've been out at this thing in mud for a long time, teaching uh, small business workshops the whole time too. I'm out there monthly for years doing the same thing at the same time too. So to that end, I'll go ahead and move to one more topic and I'll let someone else, someone else have it. The key thing yeah, basically yeah. again, is that in the stock market, you got to learn positioning, one. And two, find out what your risk ratio actually is. And it's because to get with me after the program is over and I'll give it the formula to figure that out, okay? Mr. Hill, at this point, I've been a revenue officer for 34 years. I've seen the poorest of two teeth Ridge runners down to multi million dollar corporations in terms of wealth and also assets. What you do when you see these and count these people and everything, you ask them questions how did you get it all together? This is how we learned the same time to ask the, the multi millionaire, the, 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 the Red Barnes and those guys who actually owns a lot of money and everything, ask them what did they do and take notes. And that's important. You can come back then bring the information back to the community and try to educate others at the same time about the same thing too. Okay. And one more thing before I give it a go, uh, uh, the, the consistent quality that we all here as professionals learn has to be, has to remain consistent and also passed on to the, to the next generation. You got to learn. We can't make the first sale, the last sale. We got to learn, we call programmatic, a little at a time, step by step. They say in Kiswahili, Hapa at this point. Uh, I'll address some other issues later on, but I'm, again, I'm going to let, let someone else speak it. Speak it. At this all right, brother. Uh, brother Jeff, did you want to uh, comment on, on the comment? Yes, yes, yes. And to your point, that's exactly what I did, Mr. Perry. I started asking those questions. I'm a sponge. Anytime I'm, I'm around somebody who knows more or even less than me, I don't mind listening. And, and, and to your point, that is the nail on the head. I started asking the question. And that's one of the things we were taught, especially when you're sitting down with business owners is, how did you get in business? Because you know it's good to know, did you start it in your garage and it built into this? Did you inherit it? And if so, that lets me know where their mindset is. Because a lot of times when somebody started a business from the ground up, they want to make sure they pass that thing from generations. Well, unfortunately, most businesses do not survive by the time it gets to the third generation, right? So when I started asking those questions, um, it, it's, it's the percentages, the smallest percentages, of course, I think it's 7% of the businesses um, are, are still remaining by the time it gets to the third generation. So there's a 93% chance that business will fail by the time it gets to the third. So it's rare. 
when you see somebody who is the third generation of a business that's really still successful as the first. And I love those conversations because that's where I want to know, well, what did you do different? And I remember, I don't know if you guys know who the Dealers Corporation is. So if you imagine like Macy's, Dealers would be in the same line as Macy's. Well, Dealers is here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And one of the things my church does, I was part of this building of the business of building a faith-based business. So I got to meet the uh, senior vice president, Bill Dillard. And that was a question that I asked him is, okay, you're the third generation. What was it that you saw? Or what, what was it that your parents and grandparents were teaching you that allowed you to step into this role and still run it as effectively? And I also like to ask them, what books are you reading? Because that tells me a lot as well, because five years from now, the things that are gonna matter the most is the people you hang out with and the books you've read, right? So if this person is a successful multi-million dollar CEO, probably a billion dollar company, I wanna know because if I set my goal up there, I gotta be in the conversation. And he said, it wasn't, it wasn't so much of what they taught me versus what I saw them do. He's like, they just modeled hard work, commitment, communication. So that's key. In our families, we are creatures of habit. We know that. What are we modeling? So sometimes you don't necessarily have to sit your, student, your, your, your kids down and teach them. They're going to pay attention to what you're doing. And that's a part of the problem when you think about building wealth is sometimes we're not modeling what we need to do. Now, in terms of the question of what can we do and what kind of opportunities lie in this virtual world, TikTok, for example, there are well, social media in general. There are so many people making so much money on social media right now. Sometimes I don't know why some of these people are fighting to go to college because the amount of income that's being offered to people with a college degree is absolutely subpar. I remember back in the 80s, my father was making $32,000 a year. And I remember him telling me, I was like, that was long money back then when I look at today's dollars. That means based on inflation, average salaries should probably be around $90,000 a year. That should be almost general across the board, right? But no, there are still people who are graduating with a college degree that are fighting for $35,000, $45,000. And maybe it's different in your cities. And I'm in Arkansas. It's a little different here. And I know some people who have masters and they're still making that kind of money. I saw something online not too long ago. It says, we want uh, a master's degree is mandatory and the pay was $16 an hour. How do you survive with a family on that when the average cost of healthcare is $16,000 to insure a family? But from a virtual standpoint, fiber, and I saw this on TikTok, which is why I reference social media. And one of them was how to make $1,000 a day. And then I saw one and I posted it on my social media pages, how to make $200 a day. So when you think about it, there's a lot of people who are international and their English isn't really good, right? We all have been speaking English on this on this platform today. What's stopping any one of us from saying, hey, let me go do voiceovers for these people who are international and they need an English speaking voice. And the guy showed the numbers and showed how many requests. I think it was something like $50 an hour or something like that or $100 an hour to do voiceovers. And all of a sudden you see how many people are needing voiceovers. If you have a good speaking voice and a good reading voice, why not put yourself out there? Another thing that I saw somebody doing was, um, it was a free app. The guy showed the free website and how to remove images, uh, background images from a photo. And that might be a $5 gig, right? And literally you put, you upload the photo and click a button and it removes the background. And now you have created a business virtually. You don't have to go anywhere to do that. Nine times out of 10, you're spending time all day long on a cell phone, on the computer, watching YouTube videos, all this kind of stuff. But what are you doing that enhances your financial IQ? What are you doing that enhances your multiple sources of income, which is another question I ask wealthy people. And that was the number one answer. Oh, I had multiple sources of income. I never depended on one. I learned that also from Robert Kiyosaki. So the reason why I have, what, five strings of income, income now is because I learned, and the Bible even says, you need to have seven sources of income. Yes, eight sources, right? Don't just stop at seven, have multiple. But we think to Brother Farah's point, I got two or three jobs and we think that's sources of income. Sure, it's money coming in, but what kind of time do you have to do anything else? You don't. And people, 
people we, we're, we're so fixated on the old school mentality of the industrial ages we just we know how to work and when you have a strong work ethic that can be a blessing and a curse because if you don't know how to make money yourself then all you're going to do is try to get multiple jobs let me pick up another side gig let me let, let me drive for uber let me go deliver this and we never think how to get creative and earn income without having to be anywhere and everywhere Hey, brother, I'm going to have to check on that voiceover idea. I'm going to have to talk to you after the show and create me another uh, source of income right there. I think I can speak. Brother Supreme, uh, talk about the, I, I know you do, a, you, you got a money network, brother. So I know you got a lot that you do online. What do you see as opportunities uh, from a financial standpoint online? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Hill pretty much, he pretty much covered all the basics for the, the social media, but I mean, it, it's so many opportunities to, to get online and do something, you know, you know, even if you could just grow a YouTube channel, YouTube will pay you once you get a certain amount of subscribers, a certain amount of view hours, right? They start paying you based on your views. Uh, you had to hit that thousand, I think it's a thousand subscribers, then you got to get like 4,000 hours or something like that. So with some help, you know, from the community, that can that can be did easy. That can that can be did easy. So it, I mean, it's just a, a wealth of ways to do it. And then when you're dealing with technology, everything is online. Uh, when you're dealing with, I got started in affiliate marketing. You know, that I'm a strong advocate for network marketing because if I can get paid off a product that I'm not producing, I'm not dealing with the technical stuff. I'm not dealing with whatever. All I got to do is market it get people in, you know what I'm saying? They come in, boom, they get the product, they like the product, I get paid, but I didn't produce the product, I didn't ship out the product, and I don't deal with none of the techie stuff, right? So it's just multiple ways that that you can do, but but definitely network marketing and social and, and affiliate marketing is one of, I'm a strong advocate for that because that builds leverage. So if it don't build you leverage, then you still have to compensate your time for it. Not that network marketing, you're not going to have to put time in it. But once you get it to a certain level, it just becomes perpetuating. It grows without you. Like I have built a network, so I'm getting paid and I got team members putting in other team members. So the organization is growing and my income is growing as well. So it's just about figuring out how to put money to work and how to establish that leverage base. And this is something that we can also pass down. You know, because a lot of stuff that that we might think is good, everybody just not qualified to do that. Everybody just not going to be able to do that. You know, so it's just about keeping it simple and and showing the people that everything was built on the network marketing structure. If we if we take a look at any business, it's built on that structure to a certain you know what I'm saying to a certain level, right? to a certain level because, okay, if I go start this restaurant, I got to advertise it. I got to get it out there, right? I got to put up billboards. I got to run ads. I got to run commercials. I got to put out flyers. Oh, that's marketing. You know, so instead of me paying CNN a million dollars to show my, my, my commercial, I can pay that to some affiliates by word of mouth because word of mouth always spread faster than an ad. Yes, sir. N you know. Let me ask this: uh, What, uh, when you're talking to uh, black people, what's their level of trust in, in, in communicating via social media? Is that a barrier? No, not not typically. Not if you are out there, and it, and it's just ways to, to go. I mean, when you're dealing with that, it's just a numbers game. You know, it's no, it's just a numbers game. You know, it's no different from if we got a job to give away, we taking so many applications, everybody not gonna get in, right? But a lot of people will come and put in their application. So it's it just the reverse of that when you into that type of marketing. You just gotta go through the numbers. You might talk to a hundred people and get 10 to say yes and two to do something. I mean, it's just a numbers game. You just gotta do the law average, right? You might talk to a thousand people, a hundred say yes and 10 do something and then you just get, five flat out that just run with it all the way because that's all it takes. It only takes a small group of people to make you successful in it. But we look at it as a hurdle because the average black person don't want to talk, don't want to pick up the phone 
Don't want to call nobody. I don't want to get in the sale. Well, sales make you the most money. You know, sales, yes, every, everybody that we looking in started from sales. Amazon built on sales. Robert Kiyosaki got started in sales. You know, yeah, he's a real estate guru, but he didn't get wealthy by real estate. No, he got wealthy first. Then he acquired a lot of real estate. Like a lot of people don't know, Jeff Bezos owned a lot of real estate, but you don't hear them talk about that though. But he got wealthy and rich from Amazon. Yes, sir. Right? Mark Zuckerberg, he owned a lot of he owned a lot of real estate, but they don't talk about that. But he got rich from Facebook. Yes, sir. And then he go and put the dollars because they know the dollars is not stable. They go and take dollars and move it into something hard and hard asset that'll either grow. Uh, that will stabilize so they won't lose their wealth. That's what yes, they, and that's and that's one of the things that we had to get over to our people to get them to understand that's the real catch right there. I can that and, and uh back to the question about the entertainers. How many entertainers have we seen that had a lot of cash but then had a knowledge and they went broke? T Pain, Kevin Garnett. Antoine Walker, just call them. And a lot of them lost in real estate, lost in investment, bad investment, and they did not know what really to do or they just had foolish spending. So they acquired a cash, but you can't, cash doesn't hold value and you can't hold on to cash. So you got to find something to put that in that's going to be stable. Whether well, it's real estate, whether it's business or brand, whether it's gold, silver, and assets that'll go up over time and that way you won't lose it. Yes, that's sir. The, that's the whole catch right there. Yes, sir. Sister Cassandra, uh, what I, I, I know you're on the uh, social media. What do you see as possibilities or advantages? And have you checked out cryptocurrency yet? Yeah, actually, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Mr. Supreme X invited me to a webinar that, that I had an opportunity to view. I didn't, I got on late, about an hour late, and I listened. It was about a three hour long presentation that was very um, comprehensive and detailed. It's just, I couldn't follow it because I don't have the knowledge. So I'm going to have to do a lot more studying because that's where a lot of fin the financial trends are moving toward. And I definitely want to look at it and understand it better for sure. So I, I want you to invite me to those kinds of calls in the future for sure. Um, the other thing is when you're looking at social media presence and online like even in a counseling space, which is what I'm launching into. And just to uh, Mr. Hill's point, I've been a registered nurse for 34 years. Now I would never regret going to college because I'm extremely academic. But what I think college does is it, it kind of stifles your creativity. Like you tend to kind of stay in that vein of your love of your education. And so after 34 years, I finally uh, was forced after losing my job that I absolutely love in October, forced to now put myself in a position that I would never give, excuse the expression, another white person the opportunity to shut me down financially like my job would have had the potential to do. Thank God I was only unemployed for one week and I'm now in position to be mentored at a fully comprehensive counseling center so that I can learn how to launch my own center. Um, when you talked about three and four, I've literally had four jobs at a time. I worked seven days a week, literally for over 10 years without fail. And in that 10 years, I took one one week vacation to take my daughter on a cruise when she was graduating from high school. It was nonstop seven days a week, literally for 10 years. So working more does not mean more wealth by any stretch of the imagination. But what I think college does is it strengthens your intellect it gives you a certain experience and vocabulary and it gives you a network 
to where when you're holding the conversations with people, you sound intelligent. Because nine times out of 10, they really don't care kind of what you, if your presentation is off, they shut you down. Like if you can't speak a certain, in a certain protocol or a certain way, or you don't have a certain um, deportment about yourself, they shut you down even if you may know what you're talking about. So I think college is extremely beneficial because it sharpens those skills. I went to Howard University, attended Howard, and at Howard, you had very intellectual African-Americans, very culturally diverse, and it gave me a really, really good, good, good background. Um, and so I think you do need it, but you have to understand how to balance it with, with not being locked in to where your degree is. And that I think is the struggle. Um, the, the thing when it comes to online, just like I was stating with counseling now and healthcare in particular, doctors visits, therapy visits and everything else, now we're using telehealth medicine. So you don't even have to come in to see your physician anymore. Um, you have monitors that we literally have computers that we set up in people's homes that they check their vitals every day. Those computers are sending their biochemical um, markers to their physician's offices, especially cardiologists and things of that nature. Your blood sugar readings, your blood pressure, your temps, your oxygen levels, all of those things are being monitored by a computer in your home. So you don't even have to leave home to have a full uh, visit with your physician or a full therapy visit with your therapist, as in my case. Um, when you're dealing with leveraging resources, we all are now being forced to reinvent ourselves, so to speak, to really look at what we have to offer and to be able to leverage it. And it's gonna require a lot of creativity. And so we are in a position to where we're almost forced to because the whole playing field is very different. The good thing is that when you're dealing virtually or when you're dealing with online or social media, the playing field is a lot more leveled. You know, it's a lot more level because you can do business with somebody you never see physically. You know, um, it's not even in a Zoom setting or um, setting like we're experiencing tonight. Like you don't know who you're buying a certain product from. So it's, it's, it's leveling the playing field, but it is requiring a, a different type of education. And so I think moving forward, a lot of these things that we're experiencing is for lack of a better term, uh, the God's way of kind of helping moving us forward, leveling the playing field and allowing our creativity to be, um, to come to the forefront. I mean, so, just right here tonight, we have a brother in Arkansas, a brother in Florida, uh, you, uh, we're in Houston. I've had people from California. Uh, I'm gonna have somebody from Jamaica, somebody from Africa on. So yeah. yes, and it, it, it broadens contact and makes exactly. the world smaller. Uh, Brother Willie Perry, Anamachi, what have you heard about, or what do you know about cryptocurrency? Well, first of all, <clears throat> despite what all the, the stuff, despite the, the multi-million dollars people they talk about and everything, there's some, there's some pitfalls within that whole system that has to be tightened up before I would seriously even consider uh, investing in anything like that at all. Number one is not regulated, number one, which, which means your, 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 your risk exposure is wide open. It can easily be hacked into, which it has been for the last couple of years at this point. And the key thing, people who are actually involved in it don't understand how to report it. So that's what you got to be careful about. There, there are two major things right now the IRS wants people to start doing who have invested in cryptocurrency because the 
uh, safe harbor day is over when it comes to reporting. You've blown that opportunity, you can't get it again. If, if you don't report it now, you won't end up going to jail for tax fraud, okay? There are two basic uh, things uh, here. Can you go back into that and, and make that clear? Okay. Uh, what you the said, key. start over a little bit on that. All right, the IRS gave uh, people who were involved in cryptocurrency since 1987 or four when it started off kind of small to come forward and to act, adequately report information, how it was actually functioning and what you actually realized from it. That whole system was not designed for report, what they call information at the source, reporting reporting documents such as 1099, this kind of thing until more, more like 1999, okay? And at that time, the people who actually control the the, uh, the, the different minds that are out there was not regulated by anything within the Western financial sector, okay? So what I'm saying, let me uh, uh, fast forward right quick. The key thing is that no one reported anything where the money actually was actually located, any type of trading really, really took place. So the IRS now is, is mandating getting in 2021, you have to have reporting, reporting requirements. On the schedule B, as in baseball, where all the interest income is being reported, you still have two questions on the bottom of that, that form. One is if you have a foreign source of income. If so, banks, et cetera, yes or no. This coming year now, the two, the one additional form that will be there now is form 8939, uh, and also the schedule B as well. It's called FACTA. It means that you have to report that information which you've been involved in cryptocurrency. Okay, starting next year, a little more aggressive at the same time. If you fail to do that now, it's a simple question, answer yes or no on the form. It can subject you to tax fraud investigation. So you don't want to go run, run, run foul that, that whole myth. Let me see if I can get my granddaughter here to, to stand down for a minute to, so I can finish it right quick here. Jump down, baby. Here we go. Here you go. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, the key thing basically is that. FBARS was it was was a required a reporting structure there, and Mr. Hill probably know at this point in time with all his multi-million dollar clients we have offshore banking at this point. The FBAR program was there. They did not aggressively go after it, but now they're going to step up the pace on it going forward at this point. So make sure if you get involved with cryptocurrency at this point in time, understand it's not regulated, number one. Number two, until regulations are in place, your money is really at risk. If you got 10 grand to blow, blow it. But I, I, I think that's, that's a pretty bad investment. Until such time, they have more structure into it, a little more regulations, more safety for your own currency and everything. I will kind of share away from uh, uh, at, at this time. And again, uh, FBARs and also FACTOR, make sure you be aware of that. You have to report it. If you got involved with it last year, make sure that you report it correctly, okay? And that, that's important. The, uh, the other thing that I'm high on at this point, which I started back in the 1990s, et cetera, is investment clubs. They aren't, very, they aren't very popular right now as they were back in the 70s or 80s or 90s, but they're still around. That's a good opportunity for, for Black people to understand how, financing, how finance really works and how the stock market really works and how the whole thing is integrated into one unit. It's a good educational tool, by the way, that helps you to understand how that whole process really, really, really comes about at this point. That's important. And in foreign investment clubs, you got to have a philosophy, a vision, and a purpose, okay? I worked three jobs when I was in undergrad school. I worked at McDonald's part-time. I taught kids at the YMCA part-time, and I worked with United Parcel Service part-time at night in, within, within the hub. So I understand working those multi jobs at the same time too, but I did have time to invest because I understood what, the, I spent a whole summer working with UPS, didn't cash not one check. I just pocket, I just put the money into to, to, to a bank account and I saved it because I had a purpose in mind down the road. When you work multiple jobs and everything, have a purpose in mind. What is this, what is it there for, and what will be the outcome out, outcome down the road? If it's for to do something big or or, or buy a house, or whatever the case may be. The key thing is that there are always opportunities that are out there. Whenever I do my my speaking engagements for investment clubs, now I always ask people there particularly senior partners, et cetera, to look for opportunities almost all the time. There's something out there all the time waiting for you if you explore at the same time too. So don't, don't not, do not overlook opportunities at the same time, that's important. I'm covering a whole lot of stuff at one time here. I really hate to do it that way, guys, but the key thing is that what we're doing now is information sharing. Let me challenge each one of you that are out there. If you're not sharing your knowledge to the general public at large and everything, you're doing a great disservice. Go out there, what I find out 
it's more discouraging people in my field who are finance and accounting, okay? They don't go out and teach classes in, in, in the multi-service centers, in, in, in the small little libraries, how to make this whole stuff work for you. And if, if you're not doing that, then you're not really giving back to the community. The term I've always used called blessings, enjoying the blessings of the community. When you don't do that kind of thing long-term, that pays dividends back for you when you help someone sustain and maintain their lifestyle. That's important. If you don't do that and everything, you're not building your body, body of works, which, which constitutes your legacy looking long-term. When you die tomorrow, Mr. Hill, when you come to your, your funeral, beyond the Stacey Adams shoes, the, um, what else are you gonna say about Mr. Hill? If you lay that legacy that way in the community, it pays dividends for you in the long term. That's important, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, peace and power. Uh, uh, everybody, we got about uh, uh, 15 more minutes and we're gonna finish up. But before we do, I got to throw it to uh, 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 Brother Jeff and Brother Supreme on the issue of cryptocurrency. Uh, Brother Supreme first. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, to to um to to what uh Mr. Perry was saying. Um, it's some great area there. Cryptocurrency and digital currency are not the same, right? Cryptocurrency did not start in 1984. Cryptocurrency did not start until 2008. And cryptocurrency works on a blockchain. The blockchain cannot be hacked. Now, crypto wallets can be hacked. Crypto exchanges can be hacked, but you cannot manipulate the blockchain. You cannot hack the blockchain because it, it's based on ledgers and, and it's based on computer database type of systems type of thing. So if anything wrong in the hash or the code, you can, if it's not verified correctly, then it won't go through. So if I got a million dollars on the blockchain, that can't be hacked as long as I can keep my, my wallet secure from hackers on devices like phones and laptops and computers, I will always have access to it. Cryptocurrency blocks out the central banking system. And when it comes to the taxes, if I got a portfolio of cryptocurrency just sitting in the wallet, if I haven't cashed out, there's nothing for me to report. There's no reporting going on. I just hold some cryptocurrencies, right? But once you once if I was to if I was to get Bitcoin when Bitcoin was ten thousand dollars in the day, it shot up to twenty three thousand dollars. If I was to go and take that Bitcoin and take that profit and cash it back out into cash, now I notify the bank. Now I have to go through the bank to do all of this. So yes, that has to be reported because that goes under capital gain, just like when you got stocks. When the stock go up, if you take the cash out, the profit out, you have to report that on the capital gain when it comes to taxes. But there's nothing to report as long as you stay away from the dollar. As long as you stay away from the dollar, there's nothing to report. That's their whole game. That's why they have that game. And that's why they got a monopoly on that game. And that's why it's hard for us to get out of their scam or their game because the dollar is their game. Whenever we dealing in and we only circumvent the dollar and we dealing with the dollar, we dealing with that banking system. They control all of that. They, the, do, the dollar was made to be taxed. So if I can find a way to get out of the dollar, there's no reporting. So they have they have uh, crypto cards now where you can spend your crypto just like it's cash. So if you just paying bills with it, little micro payments, little stuff like that, buying stuff out the store, stuff like that, there's really nothing from you to report it because I can go to Cash App and just take dollars and then buy Bitcoin. I can go to PayPal, even PayPal say a Bitcoin now, right? So as long as I keep my my Bitcoin or my crypto in crypto, there's nothing for me to report. What have I gained? I haven't gained anything. So if Bitcoin go up to 23,000, Bitcoin can drop to 10,000 tonight. You follow me? So, so what is there for me to report? If I don't take the profit, there's no reporting that has to take place. To just clear that up. It's some gray area there when you're dealing with the taxes. People got rich off of Bitcoin because Bitcoin was a dollar. They they cashed out when Bitcoin went to two, three thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, but they went back in the cash and they didn't report that. Like uh, what's the man name? Uh Mr. Hill might know the wealthy man, the man that made the computers, um, uh, who just got under five because he bought a yacht or something with his crypto profits or something and then reported. 
So they trying to hit him with tax evasion. Uh, John McAfee. John McAfee. Huh. Yeah, John McAfee. Because he went from Bitcoin profits back into cash. But once you go into crypto, if, if it's a way for you not to go back into cash, then there's nothing for you to report because you, you don't have to show your earnings. But when you're dealing with capital gain, just like when you're dealing with stocks, that's capital gain. If I buy a stock, Apple stock for a dollar, go to $10 and I cash out, I got to report that. That got to be reported, right? But if I don't cash out, there's nothing to report. I got stocks, what am I reporting? I haven't took any earnings. There's nothing to report. I had no profit. You follow me? That, that's, the, that's the science to that. Yes, sir. That's uh, super Maria. powerful. There's more information. Uh, we're not going to be able to finish this show. Uh, I, I mean, we're not going to be able to finish this thought. We certainly want to have another and a continuing discussion. I want uh, Mr. Hill to finish up his his uh, point on uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoins, and then we're going to have our closing statements. And you can share at that time, uh, Brother Willie Perry. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hill. All right. So, man, Brother Supreme, exactly. Big facts. In my hand, I have two crypto cards if i swipe this it swipes just like i would a visa card a debit card a credit card directly from my crypto and to his point it's not that people don't want to report it they don't feel like they have to report it the whole point of people moving into crypto is because nobody wants to have to deal with the dollar we feel like that is none of the government's business on how we're moving so when you think about the original idea or part of the early thought process of when crypto started taking on is if i want to give you a million dollars mr perry i should be able to give you a million dollars because i want to why should i have to give you a million dollars and you gotta say hey hey uh government he gave me a million how much of this do you want the idea is nobody wants big government in their business when they're trying to do transactions. If I want to go buy something, I should be able to buy it and not have to do all this reporting. If I want to give you something, I should be able to do it without the reporting. If I want to transfer money to some friends I got overseas, I should be able to do that without the hassle of the bank. Why should I have to wait three or five days before this to be go through all this banking system when I can say, I can touch my two cars and I can airdrop you money right there. I can send you crypto just like that. And I don't have to worry about it. I, I, I posted something on my social media and it showed $1 million worth of gold or $1 billion worth of gold. You know how heavy that is? Then it showed $1 billion worth of cash. You know how heavy that is? And then it showed a QR code, a Bitcoin QR code of a million dollars. See, the government is slow to make changes. They're really, really slow. People don't want to have to move that slow. Business should not have to move that slow at the government's pace. If I want to do something, I should be able to do it. We're in a microwave generation. So crypto is more of what the future is transaction because things are moving too fast. And the government can't keep up. And that's why they say, well, we can't keep up. We'll tax it. And that should be able to slow it down until we can get in the playing field. All, in my opinion, all the government wants to do is be able to get their hands in them and start siphoning off money to help the government. They want to be on that beneficiary list of every single person they possibly can. I love crypto. To Mr. Supreme's point, if I'm holding it, why should I have to report it? Okay, if I report it and then you tax it and I take a loss, then what? Then all of a sudden, we got more data being backlogged and it's just delaying everything. That shouldn't be a thing. So... To, to, to Cassandra's point, if you don't truly understand it, start buying a little bit. There's a lot of coins out there. Can you lose money in it? Sure. But when you talk about the risk, there's risk with stocks. Think about everybody that held Enron. Okay, that was regulated. Bernie Madoff stuff was regulated, right? So I wouldn't say discounting crypto because it's unregulated. It's that way for a reason. Because when the government, especially the U.S. government tries to, re they're going to mess it up most likely. When you think about what's going on and how much financial spending is abused from a government level, there's a reason why I don't want to have to put my money in the government's hand to let them abuse what I'm doing. That's the whole point of crypto. It's decentralized for a reason. We don't need anybody managing the money. We can do it ourselves. If we want to blow the money, we can do it just as good as the government can. That's where crypto comes in. So when we got moved off the gold standard, everything started to go downhill. Everything started to go downhill. Inflation is going up. 
go buy some bread, go buy some milk. All that stuff is steadily going up, but the dollar is steadily declining. But you want put you want to put all his faith in the dollar, and it's steadily declining every single year, and it's getting worse. Everything is getting more expensive. So why not have some currency that can outperform what inflation is doing? Bitcoin is the best performing asset over the last ten years. I'll end at that. Peace and power. Thank you for that uh, insight. And we're toward the end of our program. This is the Source Seeker Hour, our 68th episode, Building Black Wealth. We've had so much insight. We talked about Bitcoins, we talked about virtual, and we talked about the difficulties of building black wealth. And as we finish, I want you to make uh, your final statement and talk about whatever you would like to, to leave with the audience and uh, make your firm statement at that particular time on the Source Seek Hour. And everybody, uh, be aware we're going to have a third episode and we're probably going to continue because there's so much information. There's so much information out there. And we, uh, we talked about education. This is a form of education. This is a form of uh, financial, Black financial and financial education because, of course, Money does not necessarily have a color other than green. Sister Cassandra, uh, give us your final statement. Uh, say what you would like to say, and then tell us how we can reach you. Okay, well, this has been a great enlightening conversation for me as usual, and I am definitely going to continue to try to educate myself as it relates to cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, um, it is, I think, going to be a way that we'll be transacting business in the future. And so I am going to continue to educate myself as it relates to that. Uh, I am the owner of the Victoria Barnes Mental Health and Wellness Center, a fully comprehensive mental health management center here in Houston, Texas. And I'm excited to be finally launching that and sitting in the presence of all of this great information. So I just want to encourage everybody to continue to share your information. Uh, it may not stick a whole lot of places, but it will stick somewhere. And we have to start educating our culture. That's just the bottom line. So God bless everybody and have a tremendous, tremendous weekend. Excuse me, brother. everybody. Uh, I, I had a little cough that I had to do, so I cut myself off for a second, but I'm back now. Brother Willie Perry, I know you had a, a, a response to the brothers. Uh, give your response and uh, then share how we can reach. If they want to continue the discussion afterwards, how can they talk to you? All uh, right, you can reach me at WIDA International. Uh, Dot com if you like, or if not, I am on Facebook. We International Incorporated is there as well. Uh, on, on Bitcoin again, gentlemen, all, both of you uh, to be continued, perhaps at a different show down the road. I, I have a little more inside information perhaps you guys not aware of. But not aware, nonetheless, I appreciate the information you guys have shared this afternoon. Keep on studying, keep learning, understanding how to build additional wealth and be able to share, pass your wealth along at the same time. To have it all with yourself and everything not shared, I think, it's really a travesty. But anyway, get out there, do some more public work and everything, do some more public speaking, get with those folks out there who are, who are uneducated, educate them, bring them along a little bit at a time. In the meantime, thank you so very much for your time, Mr. Alexander. Yes, sir. Thank you. As always, my brother, we go back a long, long way. i uh, been through many experiences and uh, they will continue. Uh, brother Jeff. Jeffrey Hill, Hill Financial Group Incorporated. Um, the best way to contact me is you can reach out to me on Facebook. If you type in the Hill Financial Group, you can add me there. I'm on Instagram at HFG Inc. Or my line is open 501-291-0708. That is 501-291-0708. My final thoughts would be raise your financial IQ. Robert Kiyosaka just released a new edition of Cash Flow. That's his board game. 
Right now you can get a $20 off. It is $79 to purchase this board game. Most people might say $79 for a board game. No, no, thank you. And then they'll go out and they want to buy stocks and want to do all this other stuff without trying to raise their financial IQ. Spend the money on the game to learn how to get out of the rat race. It's going to teach you so much every time you play the game. Second thing, lower your taxes big time by Sandy Boykin. Sandy Boykin is a former CPA and attorney for the IRS. The first title in this book, it says, why you will be brain dead if you do not have a home-based business. So somebody who is a former CPA and attorney for the IRS is telling you to have a home-based business, that's a clue. Go pick up his book. Every single year, he's typically releasing a new edition because the tax laws change, as Mr. Perry can attest to. So those two books, those two resources, use that and make 2021 the start of the foundation of your best life because if you start to dig these roots of the financial stuff we're talking about deep you will know how to put yourself in position which is what mr perry also spoke about so thank you for your time again i appreciate it brother we will certainly continue this uh brother supreme uh the last word uh make it strong share with our audience what's on your heart peace and power yes sir yes sir well first i want to just say brother it's an honor and a pleasure for you to have this this platform and to invite me to this platform so I don't take it lightly. So it's definitely an honor and a pleasure for that. And I just want to say to, to follow me on social media, I'm on Far Money YouTube channel, which is our main channel. We have Far Money Network on Facebook. You can follow us there. Uh, Far Money Network on Instagram. And we also have a Twitter account, Far Money. So it's just Far Money on any social media platform. Uh, and I would just want to say that Facebook deleted a, a, a main page that I had that, uh, and Mr. Uh, Alexander can bear witness to this because he had to reach me on my backup page. They deleted it totally without telling me why, but the last video I made was a video dealing with the five major banks in the world. JP Morgan, um, the bank in China, a a HSBC Bank, um, Deutsche Bank, and it was two more that I don't know, but we know those those three major right there. JP Morgan, biggest bank in America, the HSBC, biggest bank in China, and Deutsche Bank, considered the biggest bank in Europe, in that Germany area, right? And after I made a video exposing how they had funded trillions of dollars from 2000 to 2017 illegally with massive transactions over two, three trillion dollars to mobsters, fraudsters, uh, one coin, which was cryptocurrency, right? But that was a big scam, right? Uh, and what the other one was, in drug cartels. Right after we released that video on Facebook, I woke up the next day, they were telling me to verify my account, which I did back in 2017. They telling me to do it all over again. Then they just deleted it, told me it's, it's irreversible, it's gone. So all my videos, all my contacts, all of the stuff, the content that I had on that page is lost. However, that's his platform. He can do what he want to do. So we not tripping, right? Until we come up with our own, but they, but they are starting to go into more censorship. So we have to be careful that we are putting out the right information. But however, we can't be scared at the same time because it's our time. Either we're going to rise and stand against this enemy or we're going to continue to suffer his impression. Right, we're gonna continue to suffer his tricked up system if we don't, if we not man enough and woman enough to just, hey man, this is what it is. If you bring it that way, hey, that's what it is. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not finna keep letting you just oppress us and mistreat us just because you the government and this and you thinking it is what it is. So I'm gonna leave with that. So thank you, Mr. Alexander, once again. Yes, brother, thank you. Thank you as always. I thank everybody. Uh, this is the Source Seeker Hour, our 68th episode. The Source Seeker Hour is sponsored by the Writer Source Group. Uh, we combat community deterioration. We're a nonprofit group. The Source Seeker uh, Hour was started way back in 2005, uh, or Source Seeker was started in 2005. This is our 68th episode. So uh, we were started in about 2000, what is this? 2018. So we continue, and on January the 7th, we're going to have post-COVID teaching strategies. 
We have some very powerful programs every week. Check us out, The Sourcing Hour. We thank everybody out there in the audience. We thank our guests. We'll see you next week. Next week, we're going to have a powerful Christmas program. Thank you. We'll see you next week. The Sourcing Hour. I'm Baruti Carla Alexander. Thank you. We'll see you. Peace, family.